we sing hymn number 416, 416. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today we commemorate the 400th anniversary of the death of Anne Shakespeare on August 6, 1623. I'm honored to deliver the first sermon specifically in honor of Anne here in the church where she was buried 400 years ago. There has been a sermon delivered here in Holy Trinity Church in honor of Anne's husband, William, who you may have heard of, since the 19th century. Though there's some debate about exactly when the first Shakespeare sermon in Stratford occurred, one of the likely firsts was delivered by the Reverend Arthur Savage Wade in 1827 and lasted up to an hour. One auditor reported that Wade's sermon was long indeed in matter, but much too short of the pleasure which it conveys. I promise not to speak for the full 60 minutes, and I hope there's some pleasure here for you as well. When I was, in, when I was practicing this, I realized I don't have any Barbie jokes or Oppenheimer references, so apologies for that. On paper, Anne Shakespeare's biography is not a long one. She was born in 1556, spent her early life at her beautiful family home in Chaudhary, married one William Shakespeare in 1582, and gave birth to three children, Susanna and twins Hamnet and Judith. She was also a grandmother to Susanna's daughter Elizabeth and to Judith's sons Richard, Thomas, and Shakespeare. Such are the bare bones of Anne Shakespeare's life, typical for a woman of her day. Because I have written about Anne Shakespeare, I've been asked on more than one occasion a version of the question, did Anne Shakespeare really do anything? 
The epitaph on Anne's grave here on the chancel steps gives us many answers to that question. Anne's epitaph has two parts. The first, in English, offers basic biographical information that we might expect. Here lieth interred the body of Anne, wife of William Shakespeare, who departed this life the sixth day of August, 1623, being of the age of 67 years. The second part of Anne's epitaph is a beautiful poem written in Latin, likely by her daughters Susanna and Judith, and maybe even with the help of Susanna's 15-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. In English, it reads, Mother, you gave me the breast, you gave me milk and life. Woe is me that for so great a gift my return will be but a tomb. Would that the good angel would roll away the stone from its mouth and that your form, like the body of Christ, would come forth. Yet my prayers are of no avail. Come quickly, Christ, that my mother, though shut in the tomb, may rise again and seek the stars. Let's look closely at the first two lines of that beautiful Latin poem. Mother, you gave me the breast, you gave me milk and life. Woe is me that for so great a gift my return will be but a tomb. The first word in the English translation is mother, as you just heard repeated in the refrain of the beautifully composed anthem by Ariana Petard. In its original Latin, though, the first word of the epitaph is ubera, or breast. We are meant to take this literally in the sense that Anne nurtured her children through breastfeeding, but also metaphorically in a spiritual sense. In Anne's day, Breastfeeding was seen as a testimony of love and an example of the admirable work of God's providence. As historian Mary Lynn Salmon puts it, a nursing mother represented selfless devotion to early modern men and women, for in feeding her child, she gave, quite literally, of herself. Breastfeeding was a symbol for divine love and represented God's gift of grace coming through his churches and ministers. The words Susanna and Judith chose to commemorate Anne were deliberate, mother, breast, giver of milk and life, and so great a gift. Two of the scriptural readings for today resonate with the qualities of Anne Shakespeare as a giver of care and of life. The passage from 1 Kings 10 tells the story of the Queen of Sheba's visit to King Solomon in Jerusalem. And when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions, bringing with her a very great train with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. You're wondering where this is going. After experiencing for herself Solomon's wisdom, she then gave the king 120 talents of gold and of spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the Queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. In return, King Solomon gave unto the Queen of Sheba all her desire, whatsoever she asked, beside that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. This is clearly a story about giving. The act of giving is a thread that runs through Anne Shakespeare's life. When Susanna and Judith repeated the word give in the epitaph and described Anne as so great a gift, I think they intended to evoke the biblical resonance of the gift of life. From Ephesians 4, 7, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, and in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel reading for today from Matthew 14 has an even closer connection to the life of Anne Shakespeare. It's the famous story of Jesus feeding a multitude of 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. According to this story, Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. Because they only had five loaves and two fishes, Jesus' disciples encouraged him to send the multitude away. Jesus responded, bring them hither to me. 
And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. This is a story of giving and providing for others. Jesus gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. It's also a story of compassion and of caregiving, taking care of the essential needs of others. Jesus was moved with compassion. He healed the sick and fed the hungry multitude. This too was Anne's gift to her world, caring for her three children, comforting her daughter Judith at the death of her firstborn child, running their large household at New Place, caring for Shakespeare's elderly mother and father, who would also have lived with Anne in New Place while her husband was away, and much more. In essence, tending the home fires so that her husband could write some of the greatest poetry the world has ever witnessed, the plays that appear in the first folio, which we are also celebrating this year. Would Shakespeare's plays and poetry have been possible without the sacrifices that Anne made to care for their family and to give of herself? Let's return to that question. Did Anne Shakespeare really do anything? Anne's family, especially her daughters, Susanna and Judith, clearly thought that her life accomplishments were important. Her family paid for a chancel burial for Anne, wrote and commissioned a beautiful Latin epitaph engraved on a brass plaque by one of the most prominent sculptors of the day, who also did the monument to the poet Michael Drayton in Westminster Abbey and the Totnes Monument just to your left. They chose to memorialize Anne's accomplishments as a mother and caregiver amid the two memorials to her famous poet husband. I like to think that Judith and Susanna took great pleasure in eulogizing motherhood on an equal footing to the literary achievements of their father. We might think about Anne's life accomplishments in terms of what Joanna Walforth calls mother work, doing, caring, nurturing, sacrificing, subsuming oneself in order to let another thrive. If we turn back to the reading from Matthew, we can hear echoes of Anne's life of mother work. Jesus was moved with compassion. He healed their sick. He gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. But mother work, the act of doing, caring, nurturing, sacrificing, subsuming oneself in order to let another thrive is rarely documented. Anne herself left no record of raising her three children or grieving at the death of her only son, managing new place, taking care of her in-laws, comforting her daughter Judith at the death of her first son or being a grandmother, for example. That's why we need poets like you'll hear from later today to imagine these scenes. When I think about my own experience of motherhood, very little of it is documented, even with all of the modern technologies at hand to do so. There are plenty of records of my academic life, but until actually writing this sermon, I left no record of the experience of having a baby who cried relentlessly every day, like clockwork, from 5 to 7 p.m. for six weeks straight. Nor is there any record of the hours spent preparing meals for my family, doing homework around the kitchen table, dropping off and picking up children from school, sports practices and rehearsals, sewing on missing buttons and patching holes in pants, packing school lunches, staying up all night with a sick child, or any of the many tasks that consume countless hours of one's life as a parent or caregiver. 400 years from now, someone might well ask about me. Did she really do anything? What a gift that Anne's daughters immortalized her as a mother and caregiver, worthy of commemoration on the chancel steps of her parish church. Anne must have instilled in her daughters the value of caregiving and motherhood. When Anne died, both of her daughters were mothers. 
The family grieving Anne's death would have included Susanna, her husband John Hall, and their 15-year-old daughter Elizabeth, and Judith, her husband Thomas Quiney, and their young sons Richard, age five, and Thomas, age three. It's significant that Susanna and Judith chose to place this beautiful testimony to motherhood, to the gift of life, between the grave and monument of their father, one of the most well-known and accomplished men in the world, and certainly the most well-known resident of Stratford. This is a clear statement that a life of compassion, caregiving, nurturing, and sacrificing is as important as a life of major documented achievement like Shakespeare's. Today we give thanks for the gift of the life of Anne Shakespeare. 400 years ago, when thinking about how best to memorialize their mother, Anne's daughters chose to honor her as a Christian mother who was not afraid to devote her life to letting others thrive, feeding them, nurturing them with her wisdom, and caring for her own multitude with compassion. Amen. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Lautaris, an associate professor at the Shakespeare Institute here in wonderful Stratford-upon-Avon. And um, thank you all for coming uh, to this wonderful celebration of Anne Shakespeare. And huge thanks to Paul Edmondson and everyone at Holy Trinity Church for organizing today's event. As part of our proceedings, we are showcasing anthology poems representing Anne Shakespeare, the first ever collection of poems dedicated to Anne Shakespeare, co-edited by me, Paul Edmondson, Aaron Kent, and Catherine Charl, introduced by Dame Janet Sussman, and published by the incredible and award-winning Broken Sleep Books, a socially conscious publisher devoted to diversifying voices in the literary arts, founded by Aaron Kent. All the proceeds from this book will go towards supporting the vital educational work that the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust is doing particularly for school children, so every copy purchased helps the trust implement its important and inspiring projects. Today, in a moment, you'll hear a selection of poems from this collection, two by Sally Bailey and Kat Wetherill, set to captivating animations by Susie Hanna and Sarah Jane Krausen, and three poems read by Aaron Kent, which will give you just a taste of the fabulously diverse work in the anthology. But before that, I want to say just a few words about how and why this book came together. Now, you won't have failed to notice that this year marks the 400th anniversary of Mr. William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories and Tragedies, the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays published in 1623 and known today simply as the First Folio. What's less widely known, however, is that during the printing of that very volume, Anne Shakespeare died. In fact, the makers of the first folio were working on Othello on the 6th of August when Anne breathed her last. It's incredible that we know that. And it's also um, incredible, too, that um, Anne left this world during the printing of a play about the ways in which the stories told about women can prove destructive to them and those around them. In many ways, Anne has herself suffered because of the stories told about her. We put together the anthology because we believe it is time for Anne to speak back to history and because we feel she deserves a book of her own, a book which challenges some of the stereotypes and assumptions about her. The anthology therefore seeks to ensure that the quarter centenary of Anne's death will not simply be elided in favor of the sole memorialization of her more renowned dramatist husband. Instead, it places her center stage, celebrating her memory while engaging with the ways in which her lost agency can be reclaimed. Setting Anne free from the restrictions of being simply Shakespeare's wife, or even worse, Shakespeare's mistake, who he felt compelled to marry, this collection not only excavates previously 
hidden histories and poetical reimaginings of this enigma enigmatic figure, but brings to the fore, fore a kaleidoscope of new Anne's, reflecting today's broad variety of female and female identifying perspectives, social identities, sexualities, ethnic backgrounds, and national and regional affiliations, as well as drawing on the richness of responses from neurodiverse and physically diverse creative communities containing historical poems alongside 67 newly commissioned works, one for every year of Anne's life, this collection mines the unexplored possibilities of that life, presenting some fresh answers to both old and newly posed questions. So fire your imaginations here. Was Anne a writer, poet, or storyteller? How did she cope with Hamnet's tragic early death? How might she have reacted to the prejudices attached to women's social roles? And what was her relationship with her daughters, Susanna and Judith, like? How did she articulate her own gender or sexual identity? Did she navigate her world with a non-normative body or with a neuroatypical outlook? Could she have struggled with her mental health? What were her deepest secrets? This volume interfaces not only with who Anne was or what she might have meant to past generations, but with what she represents for us today. And what fabulously diverse and compelling creations arose from this challenge. In the pages of the Anthology, you will find an Anne who is a grieving mother, an exploited wife, a canny businesswoman, a biting satirist, an Anne who is devoted to her will, in both senses of that word, and Anne, who challenges the prejudices of her age by engaging in interracial relationships or intimate relationships with other women. And Anne, seen through Nigerian ancestral traditions, who appears as something akin to a nature deity. And Anne, who is a poet or the inspiration for William Shakespeare's plays, and so many other Annes. But engaging with what Anne means to us now also means looking towards the future to the possibilities for appropriating and owning the past and the terms we use to do this, which we are bequeathing to future generations. This is why we were keen to include children's voices too, and we are so grateful to the staff um, at Holy Trinity Church School for facilitating the contribution of six year five pupils, nine and 10 year olds, who provided inspiring and moving poems for this collection too how we interpret history's influential figures and how we involve our younger members of society in those conversations matters. Every time we represent the image of Anne Shakespeare, what we are really seeing is ourselves. I would like to end by thanking all the contributors to the collection. You have made this book what it is with your willingness to engage with Anne creatively and with what she means to you today. Thanks also to Dame Janet Sussman, to my fellow editors Paul Edmondson, Catherine Scheil, and of course Aaron Kent and his team who threw their energy and commitment behind this volume. And thanks again to Holy Trinity Church, to the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust for, for supporting this project, to the Shakespeare Institute and my colleagues there, and the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the University of Birmingham who helped fund this project. And to all of you for attending today, and to those of you watching on the live stream, we invite you all to reimagine your own Anne's, inspired by the anthology, and hope you find it as richly rewarding an experience as it was for those of us who collaborated on its creation. Thank you so much indeed. My name's Kat and I'm one of the poets who contributed to Anthology and I find it very hard to believe that, that Shakespeare would have romanced a woman who lacked passion. Surely Anne would have been a woman who was alive to the glories of this world. And so my poem on seeing forget-me-nots takes place in the garden of Henley Street in 1588. Will has departed for London. Anne is at home with the in-laws and in between caring for the twins and cleaning the hearth and baking bread, she finds herself in the garden and the rain is coming down and she sees the forget-me-nots blooming and she is transported to another time, another place 
when she was down by Shottery Brook with a young man in her arms, kissing her with the passion of a poet on seeing forget-me-nots, Henley Street Garden, 1588. On seeing forget-me-nots, Henley Street Garden, Spring, 1588. I am here and shall remain steadfast, contained. But on a day like this, when the rain falls soft on your lashes and lips, remember, my love, that moment of bliss when rain fell upon us down by the brook and love felt eternal. Hello, thank you very much. I am Aaron Kent and I am the publisher of Broken Sleep Books and one of the editors of this anthology. Um, today, when I came to Stratford-upon-Avon, this is my first time here. I live in Ceredigion in Wales, but I'm from Cornwall. Um, this is my first time here. My wife and I went to Anne's Cottage, and it was quite emotional to visit it for the first time, 400 years after her passing, having edited this book. So I took it to various places and took photos of it in her house, in her garden, along the lavender and the rosemary. And it was quite an emotional moment to be able to do that. But it was a really... It was a deep honor to be part of this book because I think it indicates the breadth of Anne's influence outside of William. And that is such that I, a working class editor who went to a state school, has such deep love for, for the works of William Shakespeare, but also for Anne as well as a person. And one of my favorite things about this anthology was the depth of voices and the diversity of voices in this and also, really quickly in the biographies, where everyone wrote just a few lines about themselves, we did a biography for William Shakespeare, and it says, William Shakespeare was a poet and playwright and the husband of Anne Shakespeare. <laughs> and I enjoyed that a lot. That's my favorite bio that I've, I've ever read. So I'm going to read three poems that sum up the diversity of influence on from Anne. Uh, and the joyful thing, when we were soliciting commissions and poets to write for this, is that I don't think we faced a single person who said, I don't know enough to write about this. We had people who said, I don't know loads about this, but they went away and researched it and came back with poems. Not poem, poems. And I think that is wonderful, and that speaks to her influence. So I'm going to read a diverse range of free poems which indicate the diversity of races, of sexualities, of genders, of class that Anne has influenced. And I'm going to start with a poem by Taylor Edmonds, who is a poet from South Wales. In the poem, I am a soaring kingfisher. Find me in the highlands, air goddess, blue wings. Blink and you'll miss me, fire flash of neon. I am the thriving forest. My trees clamor in the race for sunlight. Hunters barefoot on my earth, inhale. Bow and arrow for the heart. I am the river that turns the town. Drink from me, bathe in me, to cool from summer heat. At night I catch the stumbling men that fall to their knees, slurring about a cruel twist of fate. In the poem I am no mother, wife, lover, no woman anchored by the weight of her own body. And the next poem I'm gonna read is by an award-winning poet and author, uh, Andrew Macmillan, who also edited the recent excellent anthology, 100 Queer Poems, and is a professor at Manchester Metropolitan University. And when I read this poem, because I asked Andrew to, if he had a poem for it, when I read this one, I thought, well, this is, for me, was the centerpiece of the anthology. I, I adored it. What I told him. He came in once with a ditty about the armfuls of fruit he'd foraged for us, and I told him that he was terrible at rhyme. The night of his premiere, I said we couldn't go, there were carols in the park, and I wanted us there as a family. Those nights he tossed and turned, racked with worry about writing me into some hemmed-up sonnet. I tried to reassure him that no one really reads his poems. 
No one would stop me in the street. I called him lazy, told him that his work was not the work of men. It was not a proper job. He had no right to be so tired. All of this I said for love. He had so much praise. I saw how much it troubled him. I had to try and save him from the crowded world. He needed to write, and in order to write, he had to believe that nobody was watching. And finally, I'm going to read a poem from a dear friend of mine and one of my favorite living poets, Yusuf M. Kashmir, who was born and raised in Badawi refugee camp and came at us with two poems that we included. And his, um, he wrote Writing the Camp about his experiences in Badawi refugee camp, which was a Royal Society of Literature and Dachi Prize. And he wrote this one of these poems, Anne, which I think is just wonderful. Anne is also time in Arabic, the now without excess. Time extracted from the rib, not the man's rib. A gift or the present in time for those living on the edge to ponder time and its lack, to hush ghosts. Anne polishes intentions and silverware, lullabying absence. Thank you. Anne, Anne, God's Favour, is a film by filmmaker Susie Hanna responding to a poem by me, Sally Bailey. I just want to say a few brief words on the poem. I wrote this poem as a way of thinking about Anne Shakespeare as a metaphor for all the lost wives and daughters in literary and biblical history and then as a way of thinking about the exigences of poetry and the craft of the poet, which compresses and reduces autobiography for the sake of the tight, you might even say cruel, craft of poetry. So here in this poem, life and love are traded in for the poet's commitment to his art. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, Anne has a life of her own, which is not seen or heard. After all, there have been many Annes in history forsaken by the will or status of their husbands. Disappearing Annes. Disappearing. This poem recalls young Anne Shakespeare, as it recalls lost wives, Shylock's Lear, and his daughter, Jessica, as a way of reflecting upon poems lost and lives left unrecorded, disappearing poetic moments in all our lives, lives we have given away to others, what you might call the romance of life, which takes, but doesn't always, Return. God's favour, Anne. My turquoise, I would not have given it for a wilderness of monkeys. Turquoise, he gave her turquoise, like the queen whose hand, pale and slender, manages her own, the quill, the knife, the gist of the matter, the leaves, the trees, the bark and the running sap, wax sealing promises to courtiers who wait for her, to drop curlicues of grace remnants of her petticoat torn by the latch on the window pane remnants of her petticoat torn by the latch on the window pane at what time will they hang her at what time at what time will they declare her dead Anne. last night she stole in to see her love would he would he have her would he would he have her he said he would kiss her underneath the oak, the white birch, the ash, her hands splayed upon the bark, fragments beneath her nails, fragments beneath her nails. 
she did not wash for days. The witch said, Queen, you say? Queen, I say, for the one God has favoured. Ah. Ah. Seal her, seal her, seal her underneath her nails. There the blood runs. Three trees standing in a wood. Gold, frankincense and myrrh. Branches laden with words, with words. Unto us a child is born, unto us a child. Prayers for the one God favours. Anne, Anne. She stands beneath the window, tall as a cypress tree, and her name was Agnes before it was Anne, while the trees, rich in scent, bend. While the trees, rich in scent, Always in mourning for her mother, Anne, though no one remembers. Where is Lear? Where is Lear? Under the cypress trees, she stands tall, and the wind cannot break her. The wind cannot break her. She runs as daughters will from their father. Once a bachelor loved a woman, as she now loves a man. Thank you to our poets. Thank you to our preacher. Let us pray. Dear loving Father, we worship you for your great gift of life, the lives around us, our place in your creation. We pray for peace in your world. We pray for all areas of the world where people suffer, overseas and here in our own country, in our own towns, our own neighbourhoods. We pray that the hearts of world leaders will be guided by wisdom and justice and that they may seek for peace. We pray for all who are sick, all who suffer in body, mind or spirit. We pray for Helen Calcutt and we name in our hearts those whom we know in need of God's healing touch. We pray for all who mourn, all who are racked by grief. We pray for the recently departed Edward Weatherhead, Rob Lister, Sheila Ward. And in the year's mind, we pray for Richard Boswell, Geoffrey Lees, 
Mabel Lapworth, Brian Curran, Peter Rowland, Raymond Simpson Smith, and all whom we have loved departed this life. And with the communion of saints in mind, a collect for Anne Shakespeare. O Lord our God, maker of mothers and genius, we give thanks for Anne Shakespeare, whose life and dedication nurtured children, a household, a neighborhood, her husband and creativity. May we be so inspired to live out your poetry in our lives that we may set forth the divine art of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Our final hymn during which a collection is taken is hymn number 368, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. Well done, Catherine. Loving Father, bless these the gifts of thy faithful people for the good of your church and all the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, all of you, for coming along to commemorate Anne Shakespeare. Thank you to all of you watching online. And the service will be available on the Holy Trinity Church's YouTube channel for as long as people want to watch it, I suppose. Thank you to our choir. Thank you to Ariana for your anthem. Thank you to our poets. Chris and Sally and Kat and Aaron, and thank you to Catherine for preaching so beautifully this evening.
the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and in his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Now, do stay for refreshments after the service, and there are copies of the anthology available for purchase, of course.